month has come to an end and that means that I'm going to talk about everything that I watched in February. I started off the month by rewatching Bo Burnham Inside, written, directed, shot, edited, composed, and starring Bo Burnham. When this first came out, I thought that it would age poorly because it's a special about the COVID isolation that we all went through and how it affected our mental health. And although it's definitely about that, it's really about our reliance on social media and how it has affected us and how it will affect the generation moving forward. It's such a heartbreaking experience because as the special begins, and let's be honest, it's really a film, it's kind of traditional Bo Burnham shenanigans, but about halfway through, the tone completely changes, and the true nature of Bo, or at least this fictionalized depiction of him, shows. And where the songs only had undertones of declining mental health, now it's on full display. Also, the fact that this is all shot in one room, and it's still visually appealing, is such a feat to me as a wannabe filmmaker. This is a remarkable piece of art, and I plan to make a video on it someday, 10 out of 10. Then I watched Hereditary, written and directed by Ari Aster. Hereditary is scientifically the scariest movie ever made, apparently. And although I wouldn't necessarily agree to that, this film has this underlying tension throughout the entire film, and it makes the entire experience really disturbing. All the performances were great, but Toni Collette is definitely the highlight. She is such an expressive actress, and she's able to convey despair in such an over-the-top way while still not feeling in your face. Also, the cinematography and lighting is just gorgeous, and this, along with Babadook, really reshaped modern horror in terms of horror and visuals. I also loved the ending and how interpretable it was. I'm really excited to see Midsommar and Ari Aster's next film, Bo is Afraid, 9 out of 10. Then I watched Knock Out the Cabin, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. I made a video on this already, so if you want to watch it, here you go. But what I will say is that the thrills are really good and the performances are all great, but the dialogue and cinematography could be awkward at points, 7 out of 10. Then I watched You People, directed by Kenya Barris. This was a really difficult watch. Jonah Hill got a few chuckles out of me, but other than that, this was film was really unbearable, and Eddie Murphy's performance was really underwhelming. He's not bad or anything, it's just that he's not funny. And how can you get Eddie Murphy and manage to make him unfunny? The visual style of this film is very drab and generic, and it tries to have this hip sort of editing style, but it felt forced and didn't match the tone of the film at all. The dialogue felt like a 40-year-old trying to connect with teenagers, but the dialogue isn't coming out of a teenager, it's coming out of a 40-year-old. I don't know what they're going for, but it was not good. Jonah Hill also had no chemistry with Lauren London, and the relationship felt really forced. I can't say if she's a good actress or not, because I've not really seen her in anything, but. Uh, uh, she was not great here. Honestly, I think this film could be really cool because it's rare to see a film about the struggles of a biracial couple in the modern world. Huge missed opportunity, and this is by far the worst film of the year so far, 3 out of 10. Then I watched Stagecoach, directed by John Ford. So I'm not really a huge John Wayne fan because oftentimes his ego surpasses his performances, but here he was really good and it made me wish that he'd put this much effort into all of his films, but uh... He's dead, so he can't. John Ford's name should be up there with the greatest filmmakers of today because of his influence on American and even Japanese cinema. He managed to make films that hold up nearly a century later. The cast of characters in this film are all really great and memorable, with each of them adding something to the film. And the film's message on reputation was really good and told in such a real and compelling way. The action is so beautiful, and the chase scene with the Apaches is iconic for a reason. This film is great, but I could totally see a true gratification where they added modern twists or something, because there's stuff that could be expounded on with a longer runtime and better technology. But this film is still great and worth watching simply for the introduction of Ringo, 8 out of 10. Then I watched Mission Impossible 2, directed by John Woo. I wasn't a huge fan of the first film, but Brian De Palma's presence was greatly missed. The smooth editing of the first film is ditched in exchange for a really cheesy early 2000s quick cut explosion fest. The script is just awful, and the dialogue is so corny and not in a good way, and the love interest is dumb and forced onto the film. People say that the franchise gets better after this, and here's the hoping, 3 out of 10. Then I watched Superbad, directed by Greg Matola. Superbad is one of the craziest, funniest, and wittiest films out there. And then at the end, it just decides to be really sweet and endearing, and it works really well. Michael Sarah, Jonah Hill, and Christopher Mintz are all really great and have such a great dynamic with one another, and the script is really kinetic and has this energy that lasts long after the film ends. Also, Bill Hader and Seth Rogen are hilarious and definitely have a lot of quotable lines that my mother won't allow me to say because she checks my iPad. McLovin is one of the best scenes in cinematic history, and that's not my opinion, it's fact.
back, Stanley Kubrick and Neil Breen said so, 8 out of 10. Then I watched Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, directed by Peyton Reed. I already made a video on this, so if you want to check it out, there it is. But what I will say is that this is by far one of the worst MCU films since Thor The Dark World. However, one positive that I forgot to mention in my review is that I liked the ambiguity of the ending, 3 out of 10. Then I watched Sisters, directed by Brian De Palma. Sisters combines all of the elements of Hitchcock's best films, the thriller element from Psycho, the mystery element from Rear Window, and the timeline element from Rope. Also, the performances from Margot Kidder and Jennifer Salt are great, and William Fenley is a major creep in this film, and I love it. The thrills are so intense, the music is very 70s, and the ending is open-ended. Literally everything you need in a film like this. One thing I will say is that at points, the music could be overbearing and didn't really mix well with the rest of the film in terms of volume. This film should definitely have more attention drawn towards it, 8 out of 10. Then I rewatched Rocky, directed by John G. Alveston. Rocky is such an interesting film to me because it's a sports drama, but it doesn't really focus on boxing until the end of the film. The first hour and 20 minutes of this film is about Rocky trying to get by, and I really love that. Sylvester Stallone is so good as Rocky, and he's such a relatable character, and Stallone doesn't try to give Rocky a tough guy persona. He's not only struggling, but he's also just a nice guy. Only problem I do have with this film is that it's really grounded, and everything feels real except for Apollo Creed, who feels like a really cartoony villain. If we would have gotten more characterization from Apollo, and the film painted him like an actual person, then this could have been even better than what it already is. The score is beautiful, the slice of life pace is great, the cinematography is melancholy and matches the energy of the character of Rocky so well. It's iconic for a reason, 8.5 out of 10. Then I rewatched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2014, directed by Jonathan Liebsman. Okay, this isn't great, but like... Come on, it's really fun. The action is really entertaining and energetic, especially the avalanche scene and the final battle, and the turtles themselves are all acted very well and their designs are amazing, although they could have been fleshed out in the writing department. Megan Fox is just terrible in this movie. She definitely understands that this isn't meant to be taken seriously, but I don't think she knows how to have fun. It may be nostalgia, but I had a good time with this, 6 out of 10. And I ended the month by rewatching Rocky II, written, directed, and starring Sylvester Stallone. Rocky II does my absolute absolute favorite sequel trope, and that's when the main character goes through a major rut after the triumph of the first film. Rocky got the chance of a lifetime in the first film, and you'd think he'd be writing that till the end, but instead he's struggling to get a job and is having to solidify his reputation as a fighter. This film is such a great sequel and improves on the first film on many levels, except maybe the cinematography, and even then the slow motion shots at the end were great. I've seen this film before, I know that Rocky wins by the end, but I still get extremely invested in the fight, as if it's a real boxing match. This film really understands that in order for you to get invested in the fight, you have to be invested in the characters, and the film gets you really invested in the characters, with us following Rocky's pretty depressing life. Also, this film fixes the Apollo problem. Here, him being villainized makes sense because Apollo has motivation, and understandable motivation at that. I really love this, and it's better than the first one, 9 out of 10. Well, that's everything I watched in February. Thank you so much for watching my video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, and turn on postal notifications. Yet again, thank you for watching, and I will see you later. Oh, <laughs>